But Kerry spoke, and he had the picture of his little girl when she was in that CC unit, and then he had the little note that she had written to her parents after she had gone home to be with the Lord. Then he had her down here after the church service. That was a powerful sermon. Mary Elizabeth, my daughter, and I were sitting in the balcony, and Mary Elizabeth looked at me, and she said, I sure would hate to have to speak after that. I said, me too. We were walking down out of the balcony, and Marsha Bennett was behind me. She said, are you speaking next Sunday? I said, no, I'm not. Why? She said, I just thought you ought to. I said, Marsha, do you know something that I don't know? She said, no, that I, no, I don't. So I went home, and I had, this, I had this unsettling feeling in my stomach because I knew that Brother Carl had mentioned a couple of months ago that he was going to call me to speak one morning. I'm not a substitute preacher. I'll let you all know that. I'm a dentist. But I, I, I thought about speaking after Doug McCary. Right after I had gotten to Gideon's, Brad Lee and I went to this church, and Timothy Rush was a pastor. He was a black pastor, and he was a sweet fella. And he asked Brad and I to come, and Brad was going to give a little history and the missions and the ministry of the Gideons, and then I was going to give a sample Gideon message. And I thought, well, that'll be fine. So we got there that morning, and he gave us the order of worship. He was going to do a, do a welcome, then he was going to do a prayer, then he would make some announcements, and then he was going to do praise and worship, but he wasn't going to preach. And we said, that's fine. And everything went just like it was scheduled until just about the end of the praise and worship. And the Holy Spirit moved on him, and he began to preach. Sweat started running down on his face. He went for 25 or 30 minutes and just fell out in a chair back behind the pulpit. I looked at Brad, and he looked at me. And if there's a such thing as a kiss of death, I put it on him. I said, I sure would hate to follow that. His mouth got so dry that his teeth, his lip wouldn't come down over his teeth. He crashed and burned. When I got up there, it was a piece of cake for me. All I had to do was do better than Brad. <laughs> But when I got home last Sunday, I started thinking about what I would share. Monday morning, I called my prayer partner, Steve Winstead, and I said, Steve, I need a story that I can share with my congregation about, uh, about something I can build a message about. He said, well, why don't you share the story of the two men at the dove hunt? And I knew exactly what he was talking about. He was talking about his story and my story. In the book of the Revelation, in the 12th chapter and 11th verse, and it said, they overcame him through the shed blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimonies, and they cared not for their lives. In the NIV, it said that they overcame the deceiver. If you look back in verse 9, it tells who the deceiver is. That old dragon, that old, the great serpent, the devil, Satan. They overcame him. And I thought, what better day for me to share my testimony than on Father's Day? You see, it was 22 years ago today on Father's Day that I was baptized in that baptistry. I'm 64 years old. And if you do the math, 22 from 64, I was 42 years old. I was no spring chicken. And I know you think, why so old? Why so late? For me to be able to answer that question for you, I'd have to go back to, to where I started. Because you see, I was brought up in a Christian home. My mother and daddy, well, they were my Sunday school teachers more years than I can ever remember. I was probably in church nine months before I was born. I learned John 3.16 at a very early age. I never doubted there was a God. I never doubted there was a Jesus. And I never doubted that he came to die on the cross to take away the sins of the world. But as Brother Carl said last week, those were just facts. That was kind of generic. That wasn't my verse. Those weren't, weren't real to me. I was in a Methodist church, and if I didn't go to church on Sunday morning, if I didn't go to church, uh, Sunday school church and MYF on Sunday nights, I didn't get to do anything. So every Sunday I found myself in church so I could punch my spiritual time clock and would satisfy my daddy. I'm not telling you they didn't preach salvation in the Methodist church, but I can tell you this, I didn't hear it because I wasn't listening for it. I think the first time that I ever heard salvation was a good friend of mine. His name was Billy Joe McCullough. He was 17 years old, and he and I commuted to Middle Tennessee State University together. And he told me that he had gotten saved. My question to him was, saved from what? I didn't know what he was talking about. And he tried to explain it to me, but he was a baby Christian, and it just kind of went over my head because I really didn't want to hear it. He said, I'm going to be baptized next Wednesday night at my church. Why don't you come? I knew that my daddy wasn't going to be there, and I wasn't going to get any extra credit for going on Wednesday night, so I didn't go. 
But I noticed there was something different about Billy Joe. He had a peace and a calmness that I'd never seen in him before. He didn't talk like we used to talk. He didn't want to do the things that we used to do. He and I were best friends. We fished and hunted and trapped and did everything that you could do together. We graduated in 1967 and we both started the Middle Tennessee State University in the summertime. It was in October that he got saved. I can remember that, uh, that Christmas. His mother and daddy had given him a Browning automatic shotgun. And I think that was probably the nicest shotgun that you could have at that particular time. And I think Billy Joe was an unexpected child because his parents were in their mid-60s when he was a teenager. And he told me oftentimes that he couldn't talk to them, so he'd write them little notes. And he'd leave these little notes telling them how much he loved them and how much he appreciated them. We were out in a cornfield a couple of days after Christmas, and he had his new shotgun, and I was so jealous. And we were walking across a, an old cornfield, and there was a swag. I was down in the bottom, and he was up on the side of the hill, and I could see him kind of silhouetted against the, the sunset. And these quail got up one at a time, and he shot three times and killed all three of them. I thought, you lucky dog. And I turned, and I looked back up there, and the way the sun was setting, it looked like he had a halo on. He had a glow that I had never seen before. January the 3rd was on a, on a Monday. He got up that morning, he wrote his mother and daddy a, a thank you note for the shotgun, thanked him for all the love that I always shown him, thanked him for his little dog, told him to take care of it. On Mondays, I would have a, I'd get out at 12 o'clock and wouldn't have a lab. And so I would be sitting in the cafeteria when he'd get out at 1.30. About 10 after 12, he came in there on January the 3rd and he said, it's time to go. I said, are you going to cut class? He said, it's time to go home. So I stood up, got my books and I said, great. So I started to walk off and there was a friend of mine sitting there named Connolly Garmony. Connolly said, why don't you wait and ride with me and we'll get into something. I knew what he was talking about. He said, we'll stop at the office. The office was a little beer joint, Stones River Tavern. And if you had a college ID, they'd serve you beer. Not wanting to appear uncool, I told Billy Joe, I said, well, you go ahead and go and I'll ride with Connolly. And so Billy Joe started to walk off and he got to the door and he turned and he stood there and stared at me. And it seemed like it maybe it was just a second but it seemed like a very pregnant moment and finally he left I got home later that afternoon my mother was at work and she called and she said are you okay I said I'm fine why 15 minutes after Billy Joe had left school a car pulled off a side road onto the main highway into the passenger side drove him across the highway into a metal pole threw him through the back window broke his neck and killed him instantly I was supposed to have been in that passenger side I got so mad at God that I thought how could a God of love Somebody that I'd been taught that, that wants nothing but good for his people. How could he allow this to happen, something so tragic to somebody who'd just given his heart to him? My mother tried to explain to me that God had a mandated and a permissive will and that something good would come out of this. I found myself in church for a while. I was trying to, trying to get a handle on this, trying to get a grip. But it wasn't long until I was back out into the world and finished college, started to dental school. In dental school, there were 30 guys in my class, and we went to every class together. In about the second or third week, five of these guys came to me one day and said, we want to get together. We have a prayer time. We want you to come. So I said, fine, wanting to be friendly. So I went to the prayer time, and that night, instead of those guys praying with me, it was they were praying for me. And it made me mad. I thought, I'm not coming back here. About a month later, my daddy calls one Sunday or one night, and he said, Son, what's adenocarcinoma ovarian? I said, I don't have a clue what it is. He said, Well, look it up and call me back. The next day, I went to the medical library and I looked it up. Adenocarcinoma ovarian, a very fast terminal cancer. You know, life expectancy less than two years. I said, Why did you ask that when I called him back? He said, Well, your mother's being diagnosed with adenocarcinoma ovarian. I thought, my mother's not going to die. My mother was one of the most godly women that I knew. She had a glow about her that you could see the same kind of glow that Billy Joe had. My mother didn't wait for, for things to happen. She created situations where she could help people. I can remember one day we were in the grocery store, and I was a sophomore, and it was cold winter outside, and, you know, we had all these good things to eat, and I couldn't wait to get home to, to start digging through them. And my mother was in the front of the buggy, and I was behind it, and I noticed that something behind me was bothering her. So finally, I turned, and I looked around, and there was a young couple standing there. And this couple wasn't much older than I was. And the young boy had a little baby girl in his left arm. And she had a little snotty nose, and her face was so cracked and chapped. She had on a little thin dress with little short sleeves, socks on, nothing on her legs. And in the other arm, he had a quart of milk, a loaf of bread, a couple of jars of baby flu, and a package of bologna. And my mother looked at that, and she looked at me, and I looked, and that young girl was standing there. She had a handful of loose change. And she was taking that loose change going through it as if, do I have enough money? 
My mother just went around, got a buggy. She went through that store. She filled it up with every kind of good thing to eat, everything that that baby would need. I thought, why in the world are you doing this? You don't know these people. When I got back out and went to the car, you know, I, I couldn't get a handle on that. Matthew 25, Jesus says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was sick and in prison, you came to visit me. They said, Lord, when did we see you like this? He said, when you did it to the least of these. My mother had the opportunity of shopping for Jesus that day. Was my mother going to die of cancer? Absolutely not. On August the 13th, 1973, three months before I was to graduate from dental school, my mother went home to be with the Lord. I didn't know that's where she went. I just knew that my mother had died. Once again, I got so mad at God, I thought, I don't want anything to do with you. How could you allow this to happen to somebody that loved you so much? I got out of dental school when I was 24 years old. I thought I was 10 feet tall and bulletproof. I didn't think I needed anybody or anything. God showed me in a split second how much I needed him. One day, a friend of mine came over to my house, and he had a 750 Honda motorcycle. Biggest motorcycle I'd ever been on before that was 150 cc's. So I got on that motorcycle, and I wound it up as tight as it would go in first gear. Hit second gear, 70 miles an hour. And I was doing great as I went into that curve until that motorcycle started easing off the road. When it eased off the road, I was doing fine riding up the ditch until somebody put a concrete culvert there. When I hit that concrete culvert, when I came to, I was in the back of the road, in the middle of the asphalt, on the back of my neck, going around in circles. My femur was stuck out of my pants. I was spitting up blood. I had bruised my heart to the extent of having a heart attack, and I had a blood clot develop in my lung about the size of a lemon. And I knew that I was going to die. I was scared to death. And I knew if you took all the good things I'd ever done, if there were any, and you took them against the bad things I'd done, I knew where I was going. But when I got to the hospital that day, I said, somebody, please get a Bible. You see, I didn't know where those Bibles came from, but I knew they were always there. And even to a lost person, there's comfort, there's consolation in, that, in the reading of God's Word. But as I stayed in the hospital the first few days, every time somebody would come in there, I'd ask them, please get the Bible. But as the days turned into weeks and the weeks and the months, I didn't want that Bible anymore. It stayed in that bedside table. But when I got out of the hospital, I had a fear, and that fear was a fear of dying. I'd have people come to my office and they told me they knew they were going to heaven. You don't no more know that than a man in the moon. It would make me so mad, I would get fighting mad when they would tell me that. Oh yes, I know where I'm going. And I noticed those people, they didn't have as much as I did materially, but they had a peace and a calmness about them. They had that same kind of glow that I'd seen in Billy Joe, that I'd seen in my mother. And it would eat my lunch. One of them told me one day, all you got to do is ask Jesus into your heart. I thought, how simple could that be? Every time I was going down the road, if I met a car, I'd say, Lord, if you take me today, take me to heaven. And those were just words. They weren't my words. They, I didn't know what that meant. But you see, I had devised me a plan. I was going to work my way into heaven. I was going to buy my way into heaven, Sally. I bought a farm down in Clark County that had an 80-acre lake on it. It was over a mile long. And I was going to keep this, that lake all my life. But when I got to be real old, I was going to give it to some church somewhere. And they were going to make a church camp. And I could just visualize me standing before the Lord. He's going to say, Dan Fulton, you were the rottenest old cuss I've ever seen. But wait a minute. You gave me this fine church camp here. And think about the boys and girls that will be, be affected by that. He was going to look me in the face and he was going to say, Son, don't you know that the earth is mine and the fullness thereof? Don't you know that I own the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills too? He was going to tell me, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You see, I even think that God gave me a bird's eye view of what was waiting on me. When I bought that lake, the people that had owned it before me, that I did, they weren't as fanatical as I was about taking care of things, about cleaning things up. So all one summer, I drug these big logs up out of this lake, and I had piled them up. It was almost as tall as the balcony. And so one cold winter day, I went out there, and I poured diesel fuel all over that thing. And I lit it on fire, and I went off for two or three hours, came back, and it wasn't even smoldering. And I thought, well, if I climb up on top of those logs, and I jump up and down and press them closer together, they'll get to burn a little bit better. And I thought, well, I've got five gallons of gas over at the barn. What if I climb up on top of it, shake them down, turn the gas upside on up? I can really get it going. So I went and got the gas, climbed up on there. It was one of those old metal cans that had a little nozzle about this big with a little small one on top of it. And I just took the small one off right there, and I had turned that gas straight up and down. And I know it was God. All of a sudden, what crossed my mind was, what if? What if? And then I heard this roar, and I just dropped the gas can. I lunged it off the logs. I went into two feet of mud and one foot of water. 
When I came back up, my eyebrows were gone, my mustache was gone, my hands were all burned. I jumped in the car and ran home, and I was scared to death. For somebody who was afraid of dying, it scared me, let me tell you. But when I got home, my wife wasn't there. And so I sat there with the air conditioner blowing on my hands, and I thought, well, I don't guess I'm going to die this time. But I knew that one of these days I was going to. I had a friend of mine about this time, and he and I hunted and fished together. And we had gone to a dove hunt. And I said, Steve, what do you think about being born again? And when you ask a lost person about a relationship with Jesus Christ, they don't have a clue what you're talking about. And his comment was, it's fine if you're into that sort of thing. Steve Winstead lost his little baby son in the pond next to his house when he was six months old. When he was 13 months old. Six months later, I hadn't seen Steve for a long time. Steve had got gloriously saved. Joe Brandon, who was Steve's cousin, went to him and shared the plan of salvation on the night that Kevin had gotten killed. And I, Cindy Bunton told me, he said, have you seen Steve lately? This was a couple of months gone by. I said, no, I hadn't seen him. She said, well, he's on fire for Jesus. And when she said that, it was like a bell went off, like I need to see Steve. I got up on Saturday morning, I was coming down Poplar Springs Drive, and I was going to my farm in Clark County, and Steve had a dental lab at the Point Rexall, and I thought, oh, I sure would like to see him. So I got to the red light, and his lab, his lab was right around the corner where that little whiskey store is, and I stopped the red light, and I looked up, and I looked over at the filling station, and there Steve was, standing beside his truck. And I pulled over there, and I thought, this is, this is uncanny how this is working out. And I began to talk to him. I was expecting to see somebody that was as mad as God as I was. But as I began to talk to Steve, guess what Steve had? He had that calmness. He had that peace. He had that glow that I'd seen in Billy Joe and my mother and those folks who were coming to my office. And he said, you want what I have, don't you? I said, you know that I do. And he took a little track. And the little track said that I had a problem because I was a sinner. And that God recognized that I couldn't remedy that sin problem, so he sent me Jesus Christ. I had never questioned that. I was a chief sinner. I knew that Jesus had come. And then he said, all you've got to do is confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, and, and you'll be saved. And then in my old worldly mind, I thought, you mean that I can pray this prayer, and I'm going to be saved. And you see, I thought, well, I want the assurance of salvation. I want the assurance of forgiveness. I want the assurance of guidance. I want the assurance of victory. I want the assurance of answered prayer, but I want them on my terms. You see, I didn't get saved. Gay and I joined this church, and I came here for, for months and months and months, and I felt like I was in a little glass bubble. I wanted to reach out and be part of a congregation. I wanted to reach out and be, be with you folks, but I felt like I was on one side of a great chasm, and you were on the other side. I know now that it took two pieces of wood and three nails to get me across that chasm. I was in Henry Palmer in Tim Snowden's Sunday school class, and I had questioned my salvation. I'd ask folks, do you ever question your salvation? They said no. Deep down inside, I knew that I wasn't saved. I knew the way I lived. I knew what I'd done. So on Sunday morning, it was six months before March the 29th, Henry Palmer said, there's more to it than fire insurance. I heard that and it just went all over me. Gordon Collum and I were fishing a couple of days later. I said, Gordon, did you hear what Henry said this morning? I said, I think all I have is fire insurance. He said, oh, Dan, you tithe, you, 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 you. I even taught Sunday school. Barbara Hamilton had me teaching Sunday school. Folks, how can you teach about somebody that you don't know? How can you teach about Jesus? You see, God can, if he can use a donkey to, to keep people from getting killed, he can use a dentist, I can assure you. But I had taught Sunday school. And Gordon said, you teach Sunday school, you sing in the choir. Frankly, you remember, I'd sing between Billy Jones and A.D. Shirley because I could just move my lips. And, and, and you sang in the choir, you're saved. I wanted to hear that more than you could ever imagine. But deep down inside, I knew that I wouldn't. See, folks, you can, you can fool your friends. You can even fool your family. You can fool your church members. But two people that you can't fool, that's God and yourself. Deep down inside, I knew there was something wrong. Six months later, on March 29, 1992, sitting in that same Sunday school class, Henry Palmer said, there's more to it than fire insurance. Gordon nudged me and said, ask your question. I looked at Gordon and said, Gordon, I can't ask that question. I don't think I'm saved. And Henry said, Gordon, how about dismiss us in prayer? And Gordon prayed that if there was anybody in this church who didn't know him as Lord and Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Gordon and I went by and got Mary Elizabeth out of Sunday school, and we were sitting just about where Shelby is right there. Mary Elizabeth was on the outside. I was in the middle, and Gordon was beside me. Folks, I didn't hear an audible voice, but unmistakably, 
God let me know that never again would he deal with me about my relationship with him. I think he was tired of me playing games. Big tears started running down my face. And I asked Gordon, I said, have you got a handkerchief? I, I made on like Mary Elizabeth's nose was running. But I tried to stop those tears. Gay and Shelby were in the choir right there. And I, I, I thought, what's happening to me? Finally, the invitation was given and I couldn't wait to get down there. And when I laid my head on Brother Jim's shoulder, I blindsided that man. I told him, I'm lost. And he jumped back. And he said, come tomorrow and counsel with me about this. If I had been a balloon and he had been a needle, he couldn't have let the air out of me any quicker. I went back to my pew and I sat down and I said, Lord, I tried. Lord, I tried. I thought I was going to die before I ever got home that day. Just so happened I did make it home. And that night, the Lauderdale County Baptist Association was having a county-wide revival. And it was supposed to have been at Ray Stadium. And because of the bad weather, it was at Poplar Springs Baptist Church. And that night, Daniel Lanier preached. And he preached on the great white throne. See, that's where lost folks are going to be judged. That's where I was going. I knew that I was. And I made eye contact with Jim Brannon. And I let him know, this can't wait till tomorrow. So we went outside and we talked for a little while. And he said this, take him at his word. Take him at his word. The exact same thing that Carl said. When I looked up in the dictionary, believe, it says to put one's total, total trust in God's truth. To take him at his word. I went home that night and I got out on my knees. I bowed my head. And I prayed, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I ask you to forgive me. I ask you to come into my heart and take control. And I ask you to live for me from this second on. You see, inside each and every one of us, there's a throne. And the person that sits on that throne is the Lord of your life. That night when I prayed, I not only asked him to be my Savior, I asked him to be the Lord of my life. You see, there's an eternal difference between knowing things about Jesus in knowing Jesus here. I'd like to think that my situation was unique. That there was nobody else that was as hard-headed as Dan Fulton. Nobody else says as prideful as Dan Fulton. But I don't think that's the case. I think there are people in churches all over that are good people if you compare them to somebody like me. But you see, I'm not the plumb line. You compare them to the plumb line, that's Jesus Christ. And you see that we all miss that mark. And I believe there's folks sitting in these churches that maybe be Sunday school, might be Sunday school teachers. They might be singing in the choir. They might be deacons. And deep down inside, they don't have that assurance of salvation. They don't know where they're going to spend eternity. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11, 12 says this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life, and that life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. And then he wrote this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know, know that you have eternal life. Folks, I know that I have eternal life. Not because of anything that I did, but because of what Jesus did. See, to put one's total trust in God's truth, to, to take him at his word. If this morning, if I said, I trust in the Bible, that it's the holy, inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of God, does that save me? No. If I say I'm going to live a life totally committed to Jesus Christ, does that save me? No. You see, too much emphasis is put on the act instead of the object. A salvation or a belief that saves is one that rests in the finished work of Christ at Calvary when he said, it is finished. And you trust in God and God alone for your salvation. In Ephesians 2, 8, 9, says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Which is the gift? Grace? Yes. Faith? Yes. Everything comes from God. This morning, if I could pray a prayer, Lord, I pray that you come into my heart and you take control for every person in this, in this sanctuary, for every person in this city, for every person in this state, for every person in this world. I would do it. But I can't do that for you. That's something that you've got to do yourself. You see, all those years that I was playing church, not one time did the devil tell me that this book was a lie. Not one time did he tell me that Jesus Christ was not who he said he was. Not one time did he tell me that I did not need that personal relationship with him. All he kept telling me was, wait, wait. You see, we think eternity is sometime way out in the future. Truth of the matter is, it's one heartbeat away. 
couple of weeks ago, the little man at Winn-Dixie, the young boy that was on the four-wheeler that went around the truck. They stepped out into eternity, and our prayer should be that they're with Jesus today. But what about you? What if today, what if an hour from now, this is the last chance you have? Scripture says that now is the time, today is the accepted day. Your relationship with Jesus Christ, do you know him as Lord and Savior? Do you know where you're going to spend eternity? If there's a doubt, what better day than on Father's Day than to come to Jesus? Let's pray. Well, as I stood here, I, my stomach was turning, and these are my family members. These are the people that I love, the people that I'm going to spend eternity with, not because of anything I did, but because of what you have done for us. And I believe today, Lord, there might be people sitting in this sanctuary that they think they're saved. They know a lot of things about you. They might be good people, but, Father, they're not sure. They're not sure that they have that relationship with you. I pray, Father, that you'll give them strength and courage today to get up and walk down this aisle and put their head on Brother Carl's shoulder and say, I want to know beyond a shadow of a doubt where I'll spend eternity. There might be those here today who say, well, I, I'm saved. I've, I know that I'm saved, but I've never made it public. Father, help them realize that baptism is not an initiation into the Baptist church. It's not, it's not something that we do as a ritual. It's New Testament public confession showing that we've died to the old way of life. We've been raised in units of likeness to walk with Jesus Christ. There might be those here today who need to follow in believers' baptism. Lord, there might be those here today who, who need to put down some roots in this church to make this their church home, to make this church their church family. There's an ebb and a flow in that, Father. If they're here today and they've prayed about it, you know that, that you will use them to grow this church, but you also use this church to grow them. Father, I don't know a thing that, that we could do today other than put a smile on Jesus' face by being obedient. You tell us that there's only one way, and that's simply to trust and obey. And I pray that you'll give us the courage to do just that at this moment in time. And we pray these things in the sweet and precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.